conceptual perspectives people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements. <laughs> Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I hope everybody's having an unbelievable start to your year. I'm going to move right into this. Uh, for those of you uh, you uh, who are aware of what's going on, you know we're doing a fundraiser. You saw the uh, intro video. So if you believe in what we're doing, show some love, show some support. Uh, the information you need to support what we do will be in the description box. Moving on, um, you know, I've, I've done a number of videos about the horrific uh, injury and the fallout and everything that happened because of DeMar, uh, I mean, to DeMar Hamlin and everything that's happened since because of it. And uh, I've covered as many angles as I think I need to on it, except one. Uh, and this is an important one. Uh, there are a lot of prayers going out for Hamlin, as it, as it absolutely should be. I am literally encouraged with so much that goes on and so many times me looking at life from a way that it seems like people simply don't care. People are so self-consumed that, that, that humanity is on life support. Uh, and, and literally suffocating because everybody's caught up in their own little world. And then you see something like this and you, you see people set aside themselves to lift someone else up, even if it's just in prayer. But to watch an anchor man on live TV do something that absolutely is forbidden, pray, uh, was you know, something, and it's not from a religious, it's just people stepping out of their comfort zones to show love to someone else. And, and I'm excited about that. What I don't want to get lost in it, and it's real easy to do that, is uh, survivor's remorse. I can only imagine what T. Higgins, the guy who uh, DeMar tackled, is going through right now. And I'm going to do my best uh, to explain uh survivor's remorse in lay terms so you understand it it's an actual true uh uh form of mental uh mental disorder it's it it, it sticks and i'm going to give you an example of it uh but from what i've heard what i've been able to find and i've been digging and calling in markers and favors just trying to get some insight uh can't get real close to it but i i have been able to verify that at last report T. Higgins hadn't left the hospital. Uh, he went there and they haven't been able to get him to go home. Uh, let me tell you what happens. There's this thing called survivor's remorse, and it happens in a number of different ways. And I'm going to give you several different uh, variations of it. And then I'm going to show you the one that's a real life uh, instance of something as similar to this as you can get. Uh, you can be in a car accident. One person survives, another person doesn't. And the person is, that's this natural thing is, why did I survive? And see, and it goes down to the real deep 
meaning, especially for people who are religious, people who believe in God, people who are spiritual uh, and believe that God is engaged and involved in all human activity. The question goes, why did I deserve to live? And they didn't. Um, I've, heard, I've talked to a lot of people uh, who are cancer survivors and there are a lot that don't like to be told that they're blessed. And here's why. When you tell someone they're blessed and then someone that they've met and became a brother with or a sister with through this similar struggle and they see them pass away and they know the type of person that person is and they they believe this person was an unbelievable loving person who had a family who depended and needed needed them and they passed to say that they're blessed and this person didn't make it says that this person wasn't blessed and didn't deserve to be um, saved by God. And it's not that simple, but the mind does that. So you got to think when you're doing that, it's like, why did I make it? It's like, why did I get a second chance at it? And they didn't. That's one form of the same situation a little differently. You're not in the car. You don't know the person. But say, for instance, someone hits you. Obviously, if you hit someone and they die, you're going to have remorse. Uh, you're going to feel good. But I'm talking about somebody hits you. You live, they die. Car accident. It, it's still going to be remorse. That trauma is going to have to be addressed. And in mass shootings, the people who don't get killed suffer from some level, at some level, survivor's remorse. Why did so-and-so die? You know, why did I get to live? And there's all different types of ways that people cope with that. People take on new purposes. People take on new passions. People start to live their lives with a lot more uh, focus. And they want to honor the person that, 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 that passed away and left them behind. Uh, now, let me give you a real life uh, a situation that I am aware of that I literally saw happen. And it's still, what is it? 30 plus years later, still uh, an issue with the people involved. 1989, I want to say it was the Liberty Boat. I could be wrong. But Ole Miss was playing Vanderbilt. Ole Miss had a redshirt freshman named Ch Chucky Mullins. Uh, Chucky Mullins, if I remember correctly, his number was 36. Uh, could be wrong, but I think it was 36. Because uh, these numbers are flashing in my head. And he hit the fullback for Vanderbilt from behind. His name was Brad Gaines. The hit, you know, came together. Everybody got up, walked off. Mullins didn't get up. Uh, he was eventually life lighted away. What they found was he had crushed three vertebrae up around his neck, making him a quadriplegic. Um, uh, they had to do emergency trach and a bunch of other stuff just to make sure he could breathe and save his life. Uh, less than two years later, he ends up having a uh, pulmonary embolism, blood clot in the lungs, and he rushed to the hospital, but ultimately dies in the hospital in 1991. Brad Gaines never played the game with the same passion and fervor and eventually walked away from the game prematurely. Um, he resurfaced talking about it uh, after this happened and he's still getting treated. He's still struggling with that. Um, and so my push is we lift up T Higgins too, uh, because there are some things he's struggling with now, um, you know, with him lowering his shoulder. And, um, for those who didn't see the video before, um, uh, I've consulted a couple of cardiologists because I want to know with, with all the stuff that's going on with, you know, what, um, I'm going like, okay, this wasn't a violent hit what caused the cardiac arrest. Well, that's this thing called, uh, from, let me see, Cardodio, Cardodio, Commodio cardosis. Uh, and it's 
uh, from blunt force, blunt, blunt force trauma to the chest uh, that creates a vibration that literally knocks out the electronic circuitry of the heart that keeps the heart in rhythm and pumping. That's why they had to uh, do an 80 uh, defibrillation uh, to put, put him back in the rhythm, but they were able to restore that on the field from what I'm able to gather, which is awesome. They did have to assist in breathing and a bunch of other things. He's still in critical condition, but from what I gather, he is improving the last report I was able to get. But uh, so what happens with this is it's not something that obviously is common in football, but it's, it's a lot more common in soccer. Uh, and it's common in uh, it's common in car accidents. Um, it's common in car accidents because a seatbelt is on and you go on a certain amount of hour, and all of a sudden everything just comes to a complete stop with a collision, and the force of your body goes forward, but the belt doesn't. So that's just compression, and it's at the speed of however fast you're going. So that's a lot of force, and it will do the same thing, and it happens. Um, and so when I look at it and I see it, you know, my first thing is, yo, here we go. Somebody else just drops out of nowhere. But that shoulder was directly into the chest. And it's in alignment with what I've seen with similar injuries. I, of course, you know, I did. I went and I researched. Um, and it happens. And it's a literal um, medical uh, occurrence. Uh, but imagine being the person who put your shoulder into this guy's chest. You do it a, a, a million times over the course of your career. And obviously a million is exaggerating, but you do it so many times. It's common. It happens. But just the right time, the right amount of pressure, fall in the right way, the right force, and bam. And the reason it's not that common in football, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do, do look into it and examine all the angles. So when I tell you something, I'm not just something. It's not. It's never something I just popped out of my head with. I don't operate like that. The reason you don't see it that much in football is because, well, American football is because you have shoulder pads on and the best shoulder pads in the world are at that level. And so it's absorbing the energy. So when it hits the plastic on the outside of the sh shoulder pads absorbs a certain amount of energy. The cushion padding underneath that plastic absorbs energy. So by the time it actually gets to the body, it's not as big of a vibration and it doesn't cause you know as much trauma. Uh, what was the difference between this one and that one? Who knows? Uh, you know, we may hear more about that at a later time. Uh, but again, that's a part of that, re you know, the reason it went the way it went. But imagine being that person. Imagine what T is going through. The fact that he's there at the hospital as long as he's been there. I don't know if he's left yet, but the last I heard, he was still there. Uh, keep him lifted. Uh, keep him in prayer. Uh, what I want to do and what I want to see is us keeping this energy towards one another first and foremost and anyone who's kind to us. Uh, it's so much more power in kindness. There's so much more power in love. Yeah, there's a time you've got to stand up and you've got to fight. You've got to defend what is important and what's valuable to you. And you defend it fiercely, ferociously, and unapologetically. But to be healthy, there's got to be something positive coming out of you predominantly. Your whole life can't be in warrior mode. Trust me, it's destructive. You've got to find, a, that's been my whole thing. The last half of last year with everything I've been through is find something to pour into. Yes, yes, we need to do this. Yes, we need to do this. But find something positive to speak on. Find something positive to do. Find something positive to get behind. And this year is even going to be more focused on love and positivity. It doesn't mean that if I need to touch somebody about something I love that I won't. I don't even have to think about it. It even It's not about anger. It's not about hatred. It's about responsibility. I'm built that way. You don't have to tell me to protect what I love. It's just going to be that way. But I don't want to walk around my whole day just filled with anger. That's not what's going to heal me. And so my thing is, I want to see what we're seeing now. I want to see that. I don't want us to go back to business as usual. That sucked. It was horrible. The selfishness was at an all-time high. 
this is a wake up call. So uh, that's my challenge to you, man. I just want to kind of give you some insight on it and let you know what's going on and let you know how people feel. it. And then what you got to understand, too, all those men that were there, those fans in the stand, all those people that watched it on are traumatized at some level. That was traumatizing. But we've been trained to set it aside and say it was jest. You know, the way people were responding are telling you how traumatized they were. The fact that people in the stands were crying, the fact that people who were on opposite sides of the team spectrum were hugging and holding each other says something catastrophic just happened and we don't know how to process it. And we do what we naturally do in that. We congregate and we come together. We shouldn't have to be driven together by catastrophe and devastation. We should want to seek it. We should want to create it. So that's my challenge for today. Look, I'm going to get off of here and let you guys get back to what you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for showing me love and uh, being behind me and everything that I've been through in the last year or so. But anyway, this is a time for love. This is a time for elevation. This is a time for lifting ourselves. I am challenging each and every person to commit to being the best that you can be this year in every way. On that note, I'm out here. As I said at the beginning, as you saw, if you believe in the work we're doing, show some love, show some support, and donate. On that note, I'm out of here. Take care, guys.